So um, I'll be talking about researcher identifiers and related things. This is uh, related to, to work uh, primarily done with OCLC research. Uh, lead was Karen Smith Yoshimura, who couldn't be here today, um, but deserves a lot of the credit. Uh, and there are also some other projects I'll, I'll talk about. And uh, anything that is in the report um, is, um, of course, uh, credited to everyone. Anything that I say is, uh, if, if uh, you like it, then credit is due to all of these people. And if you don't like it, it's my own fault and nobody else's, and including none of the institutions or funders. So again, this, a lot of this comes out of the registering researchers in authority files background work uh, project, which has gone for over a year now. Um, and we'll talk about sort of what the motivations are, the state of the practice, and some in researcher identifications and um, observations and recommendations. So what's the problem? Well, I, I think as a part of the problem that you, you've uh, seen through many of these talks is more, and uh, there's more stuff. Um, and we've talked a lot about the, the more digital objects and the more content and the more variety. There are also a lot more people uh, involved um, in creating this stuff. And uh, you can see this by, by looking at uh, authorship trends in science. And this is uh, between, for 30 years or so, there was a massive increase in the average number of authors on a science article from uh, just below two to just more than two. <laughs> Really, really huge increase over, over 30 years there. Uh, but this has been changing for a number of decades since 65. By 80, in medical journals, we, look, we looked at it was 4.5, 2000, 6.9. You can look at different fields and see similar trends. And now, you, these trends increase, but you can also see the, the outliers. This is a picture of a galaxy, um, and it is also an author list. Um, an author list at, at scale. <laughs> so this, this is the set of contributors to one of the outputs from the Sloan Galaxy Zoo. And, and they're listed and acknowledged, et cetera. It's not, they didn't all get together to write the article, but there's a citation to the data, et cetera. Um, and this, this is an outlier, but it is not altogether uncommon to uh, have 1,000 contributors <laughs> in high energy physics, maybe listed individually or maybe just listed under a group collaboration name or hundreds in other fields. And so this increase in number of authors generates a whole set of questions for um, how we understand and interpret authorship and evaluation. Um, one trend is the increase in number of co-authors and some of the, the potential issues that, uh, that publishers are dealing with and that the scholarly community is dealing with, honorary authorship, ghost authorship, disputes. Um, disambiguating author names is a part of that, but also there are many other questions like how to communicate attribution, how to describe contributions to different works, how to evaluate and predict impact, how, and how to assign responsibility as separate from contribution to a work. Um, the shift from academic publishing from books to journals also changes the need for researcher identifiers for um, and the pattern of authorship. Uh, there's a loss of a sole author book as an evaluation measure. Also, many of the authorship control mechanisms we use are focused around books. And as the shift in scholarship goes further and further to journals, those mechanisms either need to adapt to the journals or be replaced with something else because the controlled authorship is, is still tied to the book cataloging, et cetera. 
Similarly, decreasing granularity of publications. People can, you can associate authorship with tiny um, nano publications, which may be a, a, the minimum observed scientific unit. This is a relationship, this is an observed empirical relationship between this here. This gene sequence is found in here. Uh, this gets even more complicated as, um, as works become more dynamic because the, the authors change. And by the way, this doesn't just apply to things that we can put in easily into PDF form, but to software presentations, blogs, tweets, data sets alike. Um, and so not only is there a lot of challenges that the, the increase in authorship is generating, but uh, there's a potential improvement in understanding. And uh, as we've heard, there's a, lot of ev there, there's a lot of need to do evaluation and to also to develop evaluation that makes sense. Um, and um, the predictive validity of many of these uh, metrics we have is mixed. It they tend to predict themselves, but not necessarily other things that we're interested in. Um, so with better assignment of, better understanding of who's contributed to particular works and to what portions of them and more complete, you could re perhaps reduce error in these analytics, have other sorts of analytics become feasible. It's hard to do uh, collaboration analysis if there's lots and lots of ambiguity about who, what author names correspond to which people. Right. Even if you find your author in your institution, finding all the rest and understanding the patterns of collaboration is, is not really, is less feasible as the data becomes dirtier. Uh, you might measure new research objects, uh, be able to detect new populations. What's the trajectory of a graduate student, for example, who is not necessarily linked to a particular institution or goes through multiple institutions. If you, they have a identifier, it's easier to track them than by name. Whereas, you know, with a particular faculty member in an institution that's permanent, maybe that combination of information uh, makes them easier to find. And new sorts of connections. So what's the state of the practice? Well, as we know, lots of, uh, Lots of things depend on rankings, and there are lots of different rankings. Um, and a s scholar may be published under many different forms of name. This is a 50 translation of, of Nor Noam Gomsky, who's a, a, an art institution. Um, and all of these text strings refer to the same person. Um, and also Avram um, and how do we know, how do we connect of all of these people? Well, for, uh, for Noam, um, you probably, it probably doesn't matter. Right? <laughs> However you slice up the impact metric, well, we'll, we'll, we'll come up um, in the top tier. But uh, for someone like my colleague, Michael Conlon, um, uh, esteemed though he is, there are different people, and it's much harder to distinguish between these two. And uh, and in European uh, cultures, this happens quite frequently. In Asian um, in Asian cultures, and, and for example, in China, the uh, a very large percentage of people in China share a very small number of surnames. So the collisions are getting larger more frequent as research becomes more and more international. And certainly other countries are, are, are interested in this. Um, furthermore, an, a researcher may have many different identifiers. Uh, and in this project, we, we used a uh, broad definition of identifier, which is a persistent public string that can be resolved to information about a person. So in that, in that sense, um, Mendeley is an identifier, Orchid is, is an identifier, but so is the 
URI for your Google profile because that's persistent, links to you, uh, it's public. So in this project, we were looking at what are the challenges to integrate author identification? What are the approaches to reconcile data from, from different sources? And how to model these workflows? And especially how to take these new forms of identifiers and figure out what their role is in traditional cataloging systems, what the gaps are. Um, one part of the project was to identify different sorts of stakeholder needs, um, use cases, and to review different functional requirements. And we'll <coughs> don't have time to go through all of those in detail against a sample of 20 different systems drawn from different categories. Uh, we looked at identifier hubs like ORCID and ISNI. We looked at uh, research information systems like Symplectic. We also uh, at national research portals and also at scientific profile sites like researcher ID. Um, and uh, more general sites that had researcher information, uh, like LinkedIn. Uh, and so if you, you, you take a look um, about where people are, um, well, we're in, we're in the Netherlands, so DAI is a is a system that is used here for researcher identifiers. Um, it's a nationally mandated system. It has something like 66,000 people. Um, ISNIs, uh, which uh, stand for International Standardized uh, Name Identifier, uh, has 7 million or so, as this is the time that we created this slice, um, but of those 720K, Thousand maybe are researchers. There are many. ISNIs are populated via name disambiguation from uh, authority files, and many come from book authors and from other and from other sources other than people who are now publishing as researchers in journals. Uh, Orchid, well, at this point, was uh, I guess these slides are fairly old. It's it's up to eight hundred thousand or so with Orchids, but it's still. Um, not uh, same order of magnitude, VF 26 million. And these identifier systems are interconnected. Um, the ISNI system uh, was fed by the uh, VF system. Um, some authority records are now being put into Wikipedia and it can become a little complicated. I mean, if you look at this diagram on, on this side, there are the, the sources of, uh, of identifier information, um, libraries, book publishers, uh, member organizations for some of the identifier hubs, national research institutions, um, these, Organizations have overlapping members. So um, the same person can come, the same person can be identified through multiple routes. Uh, these get pulled into hubs and then they're presented in, in various other systems. And what one sees is generally most of the information is flowing one way. Um, it is, um, uncommon and, and fairly manual process if you detect an error or some issue at the very end for it to flow back and be corrected. So, uh, and even within the same institution, if um, a, a particular institution is contributing to identifiers through, um, through its library, um, and by its relationship with, um, by having individual researchers contributed to the system or by its relationship with 
um, an identifier hub, that may not be coordinated across the institution. So there are some, some trends that are emerging. Um, one trend is clearly that there's a wide, now widespread recognition that persistent identifiers for researchers are needed. The problem, the issues raised by the number of, of researchers, the number of people producing scholarly content, the wider variety of, of people contributing to scholarly outputs, the greater need for evaluation, all of this has created a, a widespread recognition that something, something's needed here. Um, and the registration files, although they're um, syntactically very similar to uh, traditional library authority files, they're generated by, via a very different institutional process. Right? Their library authority files are typically created by national libraries. They're fed through book publishers. Um, and they capture a, a population of authors that have tended to great books. Uh, researcher identifiers such as ISNIs and ORCIDs and um, to, uh, uh, to an extent LinkedIn and Mendeley, et cetera, they're coming from um, a different population. They offer different institutional services and um, they're fed by a different set of stakeholders. Right, now in, there is also a, a, a trend of universities beginning to assign identifiers to, to researchers. Harvard uh, has a pilot to uh, assign ORCIDs to authors when they submit electronic dissertations, for example. Um, Latrobe is assigning ISNI to all theirs. Their researcher, Stanford, has assigned local identifiers to researchers who don't have them. Texas A&M has just um, okay, assigned all of uh, ORCID IDs to graduate students and is now moving out to faculty. So there are a number of um, universities are stepping into this in a way that we haven't previously seen. Um, there are also a number of, of uh, consequences of this and things that can be built on better identifiers. One is uh, data citation. And we've been talking a lot about research data management. And one of the, um, one of the emerging consensus around research data management is the need for, for citation to data sets. Um, and for the citation to data to be able to allocate or at least trace contributions to that data set to individuals. And so we're seeing uh, this set of principles this was released by Force 11, um, but has been sort of widely endorsed. But we're seeing a number of services to uh, now generate catalogs of data citations and experiments and pilots to start to move researcher identifiers into these, uh, into these records. Uh, there are also similar projects, another one that I'm involved with, to expand out the information about authorship roles, about contributor roles. As we have more people, 1,000 people contributing to a particular publication, assuming that the, the first author did most of the work um, is not as scalable. And so for the same sort of reasons, for, we, uh, for better evaluation, responsibility, et cetera, there's a desire to understand how different authors, contributors have have contributed to works. And current authorship practices are mostly reactive. Um, so we've engaged uh, Liz Allen at the Wellcome Trust, Amy Brand at Digital Science, um, and I uh, are, are engaged in developing a taxonomy of contributor roles. This we, 
we published a, uh, a description of the prototype in Nature, and here it is, and it is uh, moving ahead as a CASRE NISO recommendation effort. But this, this is a synergistic activity. If you know who somebody is and what they did, then you can generate analytics. You can understand things much better than if you have either of those information. So some general recommendations. First of all, prepare to engage. So the adoption of researcher identifiers has been really rapid in the publication community. Most uh, of the, the large scholarly publishers have now uh, begun accepting researcher identifiers, asking for them in their manuscript submissions. Those, it's not necessarily required, but they're nudging authors to provide them or to register if they don't have them. Those are following the submission all the way through publication and being inserted in bibliographic information in Crossref. Um, so that we are now starting to see hundreds of thousands of records in Crossref that have individual identifiers. Um, funders are really uh, intrigued by this because they want to be able to understand how their, uh, their funding and fundees um, contribute to the scholarship. And it's clearly time for universities to consider transition from waiting to engagement. Um, and this means developing outreach and educational materials, future-proofing systems. Authors are not a string anymore. They're multi-valued. They can have different roles. They can be associated with things other than PDFs. And from a library perspective, you should consider demanding more from your publishers. Publishers may be giving us PDFs, but they're starting to collect multi-valued author lists. They're collecting identifiers. They're collecting statements, in some cases, about what each contributor did. That may not be published, but that's part of the submission metadata. So there's a lot of metadata and usage data that is going into these electronic publications uh, that we're not getting back until we go to Elsevier and buy their analytics package. Even when, but if we subscribe to the, the electronic publications, maybe we should get the metadata that's been collected along with them, about, especially about our researchers who pr have produced them. Uh, to choose identifiers, there are uh, two broad systems, ORCID and ISNI, for, um, for individual researchers. Uh, which one will, uh, institution will eventually choose depends on national mandates. Different countries have mandated different ones. Um, there will be still traditional identifiers like VF and NACO, and, and these ORCID and ISNIs will feed into that. Um, they're not a replacement, they're a complement. Uh, and community identifiers by ar such as Archive will also, also be around, but you should be aware of them, attach them to, to a particular record, to a particular individual, but um, they're not going to cross disciplines, works, et cetera. The environment is evolving. Um, the funder mandates and policies are incomplete. There's no dominant business model as yet. Uh, there's, and there's no comprehensive data source. Uh, there's also incomplete integration between this classic form of name authority and researcher identifiers. Uh, but one of the, the uh, clear lessons is that researchers alone are not going to drive this change. Um, they're sensitive to, to who controls their profile, but they're, and some of them have gone, hundreds of thousands have gone and registered for identifiers, but for the most part, um, this mechanism is not being driven by researcher demands for, for identifiers, but for, by publishers, funders, et cetera. So incentive mechanisms, well-timed nudges, setting up norms with junior scholars, for example, when they submit their dissertations or when they submit their first pub, are, um, are very useful for setting up feedback loops. <laughs> 